I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, past, present and future. It's kind of awesome to be standing in the heart of this very big island. And um, I have been here before and drove, missing, making that bend in the road over the railway line up to Tennant Creek uh, to work with people in the Anilingi Health Service where they did some really good stuff, making a video for prevention around FASD. And um, uh, thanks for asking us to come and talk to you today. I'll take questions at the end if that's okay, unless you've got something totally burning that you want to ask, then just please ask me, and hopefully I'll keep you awake after lunch. Stand closer. Stand closer. Okay, so the WHO has been counting alcohol use since 1974, and they realise that it's a growing problem and that we need to do something about it, so they passed a resolution with the agreement of all 193 countries saying that we need to do more about alcohol misuse and build capacities globally to try and prevent the harm that comes from alcohol consumption. If you look at the top 19 um, diseases, morbidities, risk factors that have impact on health globally, alcohol sits at number three. It beats hypertension, diabetes, anemia, all things we struggle with within our own communities here. And it causes significant impact, especially along the neurocognitive aspect of people's behaviours. And that can have impact prenatally and impact postnatally. Uh, this is a nice map showing you that the darker the colour, the more alcohol that's consumed. So I also work in refugee health, and um, we have people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, from the refugee community. And you can see that some of the countries that are our source of origin for some of our families have high intake of alcohol. And Australia is pretty darkly coloured there for alcohol consumption. Alcohol is part of the weft and the warft of our society. The guy in your top left-hand corner met the future Queen of Denmark in a pub in Sydney. And um, those two world leaders in the middle, when they first met in Canada, the first thing they did in public at this first meeting was to exchange two bottles of beer from their different countries. The previous Prime Minister liked to get photos taken, hanging out, uh, showing mateship, drinking alcohol. And the latest Prime Minister also has photographs taken of him sharing alcohol, proving mateship. Some of our most remarkable artists, musicians, sports people have had their life ruined by alcohol. And the painting in the bottom corner was um, Jackson Pollock. That was the most expensive painting bought by the National Gallery of Australia when it was purchased, and he died in a car accident, inebriated. So um, Amy Winehouse, bit of a sad last name, she died not from drug overdose, but from alcohol. Um, there's an Australian swimmer in the middle of the picture holding a bottle of champagne. There was a Canadian ice hockey player that at the Winter Olympics was found uh, photographed with a bottle of champagne with an um, Olympic medal around her neck and she was castigated for that, that she was showing alcohol with her medal. Uh, we celebrate the fact that our Olympic athletes go out and have a drink to celebrate their win. So it shouldn't be surprising that 50% um, of our pregnancies which are unplanned are probably at high risk of also being unplanned exposed to alcohol. So there are probably a lot of women who, once they know they're pregnant, may choose not to drink, but there are also a lot of women who continue to drink because they don't know that they're pregnant. And then there are other women who live in high intake households, and we know that drinking is uh, correlated with the drinking of their partner, whether it's uh, opposite sex or same sex partner. And we know that we as a society drink for all kinds of reasons. So drinking is something that we do as a country, and um, therefore talking about FASD is often difficult. People think that we're stigmatising women and laying blame, when really this should be a discussion about how we as a society as a whole um, view, deal with alcohol. So alcohol is a teratogen like radiation, like mercury, like some of the drugs that your GP won't prescribe you because you can't because you're pregnant, because it causes damage to organs during the developmental process. And it causes damage to many organs through the developmental process, but predominantly to the brain throughout pregnancy. Um, this is studies from uh, Karen Sullock in North America, and uh, if I had a pointer, I'd probably show you, but um, essentially the mouse on the far left is a normal mouse, and then on that first picture, the mouse in that middle has had high-dose alcohol, and what you'll see is that the mid-face has all shrunk down. And what we know from studies that have been conducted through the University of Washington and, and correlated with work from Matson's group and so on is that if you get a change in the mid-face, so less, fa less fancy architecture, less of the wrinkles under the nose, smaller mid-face, that correlates with a smaller part of the brain behind that, so your frontal lobe, which is where you do lots of thinking and decision-making. 
Um, we don't know how much alcohol is safe, and the National Health and Medical Research guidelines were changed recently to say no alcohol in pregnancy or if in planning a pregnancy is the safest choice. But we do know that if you drink a lot of alcohol and that you drink a lot right through pregnancy, that's going to be harmful. What we don't know is how little you can drink safely, which is why we say please don't drink if you have the capacity to choose. And we know lots of families that live in high trauma situations and uh, lots of people that experience high degrees of trauma where not drinking alcohol is too hard for them. Uh, timing of the alcohol exposure, the frequency of the exposure and the dose of the exposure changes the effect that occurs in the child. So um, as much as Ben was talking about how every person is different with how they understand language, every child that's been exposed to alcohol will manifest a different insult. And that's further affected by the genetics of the mum. Some of us have different alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes in our liver, so we met metabolise alcohol faster than others. And babies that are growing in our tummy can't metabolise alcohol. The whole, the whole metabolism of alcohol has to be done by the mother growing the baby. So even as her blood levels drop, the blood levels in the baby stay high. So the international um, uh, medicine guys said back in 1996 that alcohol is worse than all the other stuff that we know that our families take or are dependent on. So that baby on your bottom right hand corner has a small head and he's got a bit of a squashed face. He's actually got fetal alcohol syndrome and you'll see that he's little when you see this baby who's got a big head and looks healthy and happy whereas he's got a small head and he's got a smooth upper lip and a smooth tiny lip, whereas that baby's uh, chubby and redolent. So as I said, the NHMSC guidelines changed and we recommend no alcohol if you're planning a pregnancy. And so some families who are, um, have the capacity, often say at family functions and so on, the whole family chooses not to drink. But they're obviously well educated and well resourced to make that choice. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder isn't a diagnostic term, although there is debate now saying that it should become a diagnostic term. If anything, it's kind of like a collective noun. And it's an umbrella term under which any individual who has negative effects from prenatal alcohol exposure is kind of grouped. And the most severe, like that little baby I showed you before with the tiny head, the most physically severe are the ones that are what we call syndromic, fetal alcohol syndrome. The same if someone's got Down syndrome. You'll see someone in a supermarket, you go, oh, they've got Down syndrome. You know, so these kids have got a syndrome because they've got a collection of features that are clearly recognisable to the trained eye. So it's fetal alcohol syndrome. Well, that sits in under this kind of umbrella of the spectrum of disorders. But the bulk of the children, so that's really the bulk of the iceberg that you see here, can look completely normal. Therefore, the bulk of the youth and the bulk of the adults that you're seeing can look completely normal. But what isn't normal is the brain underneath is not normal because of the alcohol exposure. And I'll explain now why, why that's the case. When we're kind of growing as a tadpole in the womb, everything kind of grows from the head to the tail, and then everything kind of grows from the spine out. So the head does all the growing first. So up to about 12 weeks, you get the formation of the face. Eight weeks, really. And you get these kind of buds of tissue that grow round and join together and join up in the midline and form the nose and the lip. So they've colour-coded them here on this diagram. And you can see how those colour pads grow together and join in the midline. So if high-dose alcohol exposure occurs during this interval of embryonic development, then it causes change in the way that happens. It's not as complex. You don't get the ridges. It's flatter. You don't get a short philtrum. You get a long philtrum. The upper lip grows differently from different embryonic tissue to the lower lip, so that looks different. So you can read that in the face. But that, that whole process finishes between you know, 8 to 12 weeks. After that, the baby keeps growing, the brain keeps growing, and the alcohol exposure may continue, but you don't see those changes externally. They, they, the insults internally and is manifest by the way the brain works and the way the person behaves. So that's really a picture showing you that the brain does keep growing. And in fact, we know now with all the research around brain plasticity that hopefully all of us in our room here, our brains are continuing to grow and change for the better, uh, even as we age. That's, that's my hope. <laughs> um, so this is obviously an extreme version. This, this photo is bandied around all over the place. It's from, uh, I think, Sterling, Cla Sterling Karen took this. It's obviously a post-mortem photo. So the brain on the right has had incredibly high-dose alcohol exposure, so it's less complex. That's obviously the worst case scenario. 
So um, the eye, in a way, is really an extension of the brain. It's kind of a little bit of a brain out in a stalk. So where the eye grows, the little openings in the face are called the palpable fascia lengths, PFLs. We can measure those openings. And in children with um, FASD and FAS, we can measure those openings as being smaller. And that's a persistent change that goes right through until they're older. And in fact, if you're comparing these children to other children that may have anomalies because of a genetic reason, the palpable fissure lengths are actually quite a strong marker of prenatal alcohol exposure, so it's a very useful measure. Um, the University of Washington um, co-located with uh, the Microsoft people, and they helped them develop a camera to take facial photos and analyse it. You can also analyse the upper lip volume. So as the alcohol dose increases, you get pruning of the lip on the, laterally, and then slowly the whole lip becomes quite thin. And those changes persist. And even people that come from, say, a fat-lipped, that's pretty good with my New Zealand accent, isn't it? Fat-lipped ethnicity, um, you'll still see changes in that. And the University of Washington's made up some lip filtrum guides where you can compare what's thought to be normal and what's thought to be less than normal and can be attributed to changes caused by alcohol exposure. You might see changes in the shape of the ear, changes in the little finger. North American ice hockey stick, long flat blade, palmer crease, can, it's called a hockey stick palmer crease, not like the English hockey. So the bulk of the kids who, and young adults that go to juvenile justice, and then your adults, can look normal, but their brain is not normal. Therefore the way they think, remember, learn, behave, is not normal. They're preset to develop addictions. They're preset not to comprehend uh, risk. They're preset to probably be quite chatty. Um, but they have quite significant expressive and receptive language issues, which I mentioned to Ben. Um, as much as we want to change language into um, correct grammar to make comprehension, we then have to break it down even further into almost sound bites to optimise uh, these people uh, and their understanding. So is there any point in diagnosing it? Currently, if you have someone diagnosed with FASD, there's really no advantage. If you're diagnosed with autism, you might get an aid. However, with the new National Disability Insurance Scheme manifest, um, there is a chance that even without the diagnosis, although from my point of view it's important, if there are three, two or three domains of dysfunction in someone, you may be able to access funding under the new NDIS, which is great. So uh, watch that space. So what are the consequences if you don't diagnose fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? They are broad and many across all spheres of life. And that's why they end up on your doorstep. That's really why this work started, because from my perspective, health was failing these children because we weren't specifically diagnosing them. And the Telethon Institute that I work at had a lot of research proving that we weren't diagnosing them. Therefore, they were failing in education because people weren't understanding how they think and learn. And then they were rocking up on your doorstep. So I actually wrote to the Chief Justice of WA, said, you know, have you thought about this? What are you doing? And his response was fantastic and immediate. He said, great, send me a whole lot of stuff or we'll put it in our bench book. And so it was the first state and probably the only state, I think, to have a bench book that has information in there about FASD, actually in their chapter on disabilities. And he also said, I'll help you with your research. And he gave me a whole lot of letters of introduction. And there's been a whole flow on effect from that. They've come back to us since and asked us to help update their bench book. And there's been an enormous um, good come out of this, including speaking to the, all the heads of the um, courts of jurisdiction, speaking to magistrates, speaking to lawyers, and so on. It's been fantastic. But if you look at that list of things that are, that are listed there, word for word, this is exactly the same as what the Australian Bureau of Statistics tells us for children that engage early, children and youth that engage early in juvenile justice. Word for word, it's the same. Loss of education, loss of opportunities. If you don't understand why someone's behaving that they are, the way they're behaving, they often get labelled. So, I don't, haven't done what you've told me because I haven't remembered. So, you might perceive my failure to do it as being naughty. So, I get called stupid and I get called bad. And I hear that long enough, I start believing it. So that's developing a secondary disability. Then I hear it long enough, then I start actually acting up because I think, well, what's the point? You just think I'm dumb anyway, so I might as well just do it. So that's my low self-esteem. Then I might self-medicating with drugs and alcohol because actually they make me feel better and I'm highly sensitive to it and I enjoy it. And then I go on to the other issues as I start trying to deal with my hormones as they rush in. And I don't know how to judge, how to manage that. So I make poor choices and I'm easily led. So that's how these children 
who haven't been correctly diagnosed with their neurocognitive impairment go on to develop their secondary tertiary and what we call quaternary effects. So the issue is about encoding. When you go home, you hang up your coat in the wardrobe. You put both arms over a hanger and you leave it sitting there. When you take it out the next day, it looks like a coat to you. It's all neat and tidy. When these kids hang up an idea in their brain, it's almost like they've only hung up one shoulder and the rest is hanging off the hanger all crinkled. So when you go to them and ask them to tell you something, that is something around retrieving an idea, when they pull it out, it's not like the idea you thought you told them. It comes out poorly hung up, it comes out crinkled, and that's what they deliver back to you. So the issue of encoding ideas means once they've encoded something wrongly, then for the rest of their life when they meet something of that same genre, they keep re-encoding it wrongly, which means they then start reproducing it wrongly. So they're preset from a really early age to be tripped up by the way their brain works, by their poor filing system. Um, in North America, there's been enormous work done on FASD. They've got great programs. I've, got some, I've met some fantastic probation officers in Canada and um, they've looked and counted how much people have FASD in their system. And there's a lot. And they know that because they've been diagnosing them. We haven't. Um, University of Washington, when they looked at their caseload, so that's, their caseload is preset. They'll see anyone who's even had one glass of alcohol in pregnancy. And they're not saying that causes it, but they'll see anyone who's had one glass of alcohol. They'll assess them. So in their entire caseload, when they audited it, 60% of the kids they'd seen had had trouble with the law, and 50% had been confined. And the beginning of that engagement was young. I talked to the Aboriginal Legal Service in WA, the kids that were doing really tough, severe crime at 12, 14, now doing it at 10. They may not have FASD, but you all know, you all know they're starting earlier. So um, we're not good at diagnosing FASD, we hope to get better. Uh, we don't know how many people have FASD. There are stats nationally, but those stats are based on the cases that have been reported, and because we haven't been diagnosing them, then our stats are flawed. The Kimberley study that James has just completed um, has come up with stats that are quite similar to North America, actually, and in my own caseload, I would say I see one to two kids a week who've got FASD. So um, we're, we're running at a similar level. There's probably about 10% FASD, I think, but that's not what the national stats are telling us, and FAS... Um, be more. Um, FASD has been clearly said as being a reason for um, the high rates of incarceration of Aboriginal people, but it must be known that FASD is not an Aboriginal problem. FASD is a problem of us as a society, irrespective of your uh, race or ethnicity, and I have it in my refugee families. And the bulk of the families I see in my um, developmental clinics are Caucasian and have FASD. So it's not an Aboriginal problem, but it's thought to be contributed to the high rates of incarceration in Aboriginal people. So you already heard this morning from Donna Archie the stats that children aged 10 to 17 were 31 times more likely to be in detention, and that's an increase up from the 27 times measured in 2008. So uh, they have problems with impulsivity, immediate pleasure, they have problems with actually recognising ownership, I need to get from here to there, there's a bike, I'll take that. Not actually acknowledging that bike belongs to somebody else. Uh, we've already talked about the problems around executive function, abstract thinking, not remembering, not learning, and not generalising. So I might tell you in this room, don't touch the hot stove, and you'll remember that. You'll go into a pink room and there'll be a stove sitting there, and you'll touch it because you only learnt that lesson in the white room. You didn't learn it in the pink room. Uh, they're not necessarily competent thieves. There's not necessarily a lot of thought that goes behind it. But they can be easily led by the ones who are a bit more clever and then be the ones that are left standing. So we talked about the impaired coding. Um, they have really great problem in abstract thought. Therefore, they don't have a great deal of insight into consequences for actions chosen. They might not necessarily understand why they're here now in the courts talking about stuff. They're the ones that don't get hip to the system. They keep popping up on your radar. They keep screwing up. And you think, when are they going to learn? And they are often the ones that are left behind. So they're easily misled. 
They don't necessarily understand the vocabulary that's used, and that's built on the fact of what Ben's already told us. They can appear to be eager to please, so in an interviewing situation or taking a history, they might just say, yes, yes, yes. And that's not really what they mean, but they just kind of want to hang out with you and say yes. And they may admit drug use, but they may have actually only used it once. They may not have, but they may have actually only used it once. But uh, their yes, when you hear it, may imply that you think they use it all the time. They can't remember important facts, so they can be accused of lying, but in actual fact what they're doing is called confabulation. So they might, they might remember white tablecloth, black chair, and light on the machine. But when I tell the story to this table, I might put in, you know, there was a cat and a dog, and uh, there was a green tree, but then when I'm, and, and those three items, the white tablecloth, the chair, and the light, when I'm recounting the story 10 minutes later or tomorrow to this table, I might still have those three items, but I can't remember what else I said, so I'll just chuck some other things in to make a good story. That's called confabulation. That's not intentional lying. That's, that's just filling in the gaps because I can't remember. So um, often they may not be thought to be impaired because they can appear to be chatty. And so detailed psychological assessment is not always asked for. But if you looked at their um, criminal history, or their offending history, it might prompt you to thinking, actually, someone needs to measure how their brain works. Um, from, this is from North America. It's thought that they really escalate, but in talking to colleagues in WA, they very rapidly escalate once they've been incarcerated. Um, they're all capable of learning. We're all capable of learning. Everyone in this room here could learn to play the violin if you don't already play the violin. Um, many of you might need, I don't know, 10 lessons. Someone with FASD can learn that skill, but they might need uh, 20, 40 exposures. So, for example, if I said to you, oh, could you turn that off? Oh, could you go over there and switch that up? Oh, do you mind turning it away? You all know I'm meaning get rid of that light. But I've actually given three different instructions. So for someone with a FASD, they've heard three very separate instructions. So if they need to have 200 episodes of learning, that's three times 200 rather than one times 200. And that, that feeds forward into how you manage them in the community and how, how all in their circle of care needs to use identical language, word for word language, if you wish them to understand and if you wish them to remember. That's maximising the exposures of instructions given. How are we going post lunch? Are we asleep? No? Alrighty. Um, I might just scoot through this. Sometimes they want to go to jail to be with their mates. I'd want to go to jail if I got lots of money and got a job. Sometimes they don't want to go to jail because their mates aren't in jail just yet. Um, they're very vulnerable to the list of things that you know can happen in jail, but they're also vulnerable, vulnerable to this out in the community. Um, these pictures that I'm showing you here won't be on the, on the web afterwards. These pictures have been lent to us by Vicky, and um, they're part of her own research. But these are drawings that have been completed by youth that she's worked with that she knows have FASD. And they've drawn pictures about what it's like to be victimised and what it's like to be in the system and how they feel. So you can see fear there, they're holding a gun. Um, this is bullshit, so it's kind of a devil image with a pile of poo. Um, they feel like a shattered glass or the trauma that they live, their family shattered. And um, future, you can see the difficult one up there, which you know occurs, jail, love, or hanging, or IV drug use, or their picture of the court. Um, kill or be dead. So when this comes up on the web afterwards, there'll just be some blank pages for this. I apologise for that, but they're not mine to share. So um, because of the brain impairment, basic behaviour management programmes don't necessarily work. In fact, punitive consequences for poor behaviour doesn't necessarily work because they don't get it. We think that if you tell someone off for doing something that they'll learn that that's a mistake and then not do it again. Someone with a brain that's been exposed to alcohol that causes dysfunction means they don't get it. They don't get punitive measures and their learning is very difficult and very different to traditional learning. They don't learn like the adult learning that, that Ben recommended before. Um, they may look 35, but their brain may be functioning as a nine-year-old. And you would give instructions to a nine-year-old very differently to the way you give instructions to an 18-year-old. Or maybe you wouldn't, but I think you would. 
Um, the idea of equity before the law is um, the name of the bench book actually in WA and probably part of what you're all trying to do is to keep people out and well and not necessarily reincarcerated. Uh, the way for us to help people stay out of prison or the way to maximise justice reinvestment and keeping them in the community productively is to understand what they can do well. And every single kid that's had prenatal alcohol exposure can do something well, we just have to find out what that is. And then we hang all their learning on that. Once we know what they can do well, we hang learning and training on that. So you have to modify what you're doing and it has to be individualised, which is a really big ask. But it's being done overseas uh, because there's a lot of capacity and money being put into that. And that may be something that needs to happen here. Um, I'm quickly going to show you the study from Manitoba, which was done by Chudley, who's uh, well respected in the FASD community. This is a study of uh, adults that were incarcerated with FASD, and I'm showing you this because it highlights the criminal history you might have and the clients that you see that might prompt you to think they might have a FASD. Plus, um, if you take home one message, it'll be a slide I show you at the end, to show you how different someone with a FASD is from all the other people that they're in jail with. They've done the study in male adults, and they've done it also in uh, doing it in women, and there's a lot of other studies being done up there now as well. So they were doing this to help identify them, how best to understand them, how to adapt their management, uh, to reduce the risk of reoffending, and to keep them in the community safe, and to keep the community safe that they were in. It required a paradigm shift. And really for me, uh, if I'm delivering this to a bunch of doctors, talking about FASD or even asking them to ask about alcohol use when pregnant is asking them to make an enormous paradigm shift. This has been a very difficult process for doctors to make that transition, but a really important process. It's hoped that if we understand who have the FASD, we can reduce their recidivism. So, offender self-report, this is where questionnaires are given to the offenders, what kind of things came up as, as um, red lights, for if they might have a FASD, making them more different from the other ones who are equally incarcerated, and it's listed there, trouble with following directions, because they don't get it, or the directions were three stages, and they only heard the first or the last, they didn't hear all three, or understand all three, acts impulsively, trouble completing tasks, trouble with staying on topic, poor attention fan, poor social skills. This is probably like a lot of the people that you look after, but they're that more on the end of having it as a problem. And they're less able to learn to be different. So of all the indicators, the ones that came up really high were these, which are really all the things that we've been talking about. Poor social skills, poor attention span, poor learning, can be really chatty, talks a lot but says little, and you have to really listen to what they're saying. Poor judgment unaware of consequences, and that has implications for their choices of crime they might do. So um, normally when we try to diagnose someone with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we need to have hard evidence that there was maternal alcohol consumption. That could be from medical records or from the mother, her birth mother herself. So I've had mothers very happily tell me that they drank a slab of bourbon and coke every week. Um, but for this study, they also took information from the wider family. And, and many of the communities of people that we deal with, we know that the kids are cared for by aunties, grandmas. Sometimes the mums have passed on because of their alcohol dependence, or they've died traumatically because of alcohol-fueled domestic, alcohol domestic violence. So it can be quite hard to diagnose children. And in this study, they took messages from the proximal family as well as from the immediate mum. An historical checklist for those that were more likely to have FASD were ones that were in foster care. And of the kids that I see with FASD, the ones in foster care have the most placement breakdowns because they're the most hardest to manage. They have the problems with school from an early age. I have kids with FASD that are being kicked out of um, pre-kindy. They can't keep them in kindy. Um, they're more likely to be treated for a mental health problem. They may be diagnosed with a developmental disability, but what's common in these kids is that they run above the IQ of 70. So if you have an IQ of 70 or below here, um, you're classified as being uh, having an intellectual disability and you're entitled to care through disability services. The bulk of kids with a FASD run above that, um, but they still are quite impaired, but that doesn't entitle them to a school, age because, a school aid because they run above that. And it doesn't entitle them to a lot of extra input, which is what they really need. 
So if you look at their record, the things that are a strong hit here, the things that really the minister, I suppose, is talking about, a really high index of being unemployed, what Donna Archie was talking about, uh, the social deprivation, the social difficulties, the lack of material capacity within communities to stay well and keep employed, um, high hits on substance abuse, high hits on poor community functioning. So we, we know this in our work, but it should prompt us to think they're not only behaving this way because of their lived trauma, they may be behaving this way because their brain doesn't function normally because of prenatal alcohol exposure. We've talked about this, poor problem solving, impulsivity, poor stress management, poor conflict resolution. If you look at the FASD kids compared to all the others, they were worse with youth court history. They were worse with 15 or more convictions. They were worse with having been incarcerated and having more convictions. They had the highest hit rate uh, relative to their cohorts. So this was 35-year-olds uh, and so on that are being studied here. And this is a slide I want you to uh, brand on your mind. The circle is around the line about FASD. So um, the zero line means you're functioning pretty okay. Above the line, you're functioning okay. Anything below the zero line means it's a bit scrambled and you're not doing too well. And what you see there is most of the uh, inmates are all not doing too well on most things. But the FASD ones are doing the worst. And they're doing the worst on two items, which is memory, um, decoding and understanding complex ideas, and um, also uh, conceptual ideas they struggle with. Therefore, they're going to have problems giving histories. They're going to have problems following orders. They're going to have problems just dealing with day-to-day uh, -day social interaction because they just don't get it. And so we see the behaviours that are manifest from that, but what's really going on is the brain dysfunction underneath. So Chudley's story alone reinforces the fact that it's really important for us to recognise FASD-affected people within the cohort that you deal with because they really are significantly different. And this is about equity before the law. You can't assume to treat them the same as everybody else when they are so distinctly different. So um, we went ahead and did the study to see how much people within the justice system knew. Colleagues in Queensland, Heather Douglas, a lawyer in Queensland, she also did the study um, but was unable to get uh, as many people on board. She wasn't able to get police and wasn't able to get um, as many uh, magistrates, I think, as we did. Um, we were both funded by FAIR to carry this out. And um, this report's on our website at the Talent Institute. It's also on the FAIR website, which is the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education in Australia. So we wanted to know, of all the people that are dealing with uh, me, especially because I'm a paediatrician, youth and justice, what do, you, what do you know about FASD? And if you did know something about it, would you treat people differently? And if you wanted to treat them differently, can you actually treat them differently? Do we have just in re reinvestment opportunities or non-incarceration opportunities in WA? So those numbers look small, but in actual fact, uh, of all the people that we spoke to, they're going, wow, you did really well to get that many people right back to you. Um, believe it or not, we actually tried to survey, we actually surveyed 1,000 police, so I think that's quite poor response, but um, the police assure us that that's actually quite outstanding. Today I'm just going to show you the response from um, Corrective Services and I'm going to show you the response from the judicial officers. The reason for that is, is that um, police were pretty similar to um, Corrective Services and lawyers were pretty similar to judicial officers and it's too hard to put up all the data. So um, we had an even spread. The numbers are greater than 100% because there's multiple areas of work but essentially the people that we surveyed work everywhere in WA. And most people had heard of FAS, so that's the syndromic one, but less had heard of the spectrum disorder, the FASD. Bulk had um, a basic understanding, but very few had accurate, correct understanding, just 26%. Um, that's over the whole that we surveyed. Everybody pretty much had heard about this through the news. I don't know if you've ever had anything that you've done reported in the news. That chap there who's falling asleep has had lots said about him in the news. 
and, um, and if you ever have had something that you've said reported in the news, I'll guarantee it wasn't actually what you said, or it wasn't reported correctly. So it's slightly disconcerting that the bulk of the people we surveyed under, had their knowledge about FASD taken from the media. Apologies to media. Um, where the standout was is actually the corrective services staff. Of all the people we surveyed, they were the only people who had actually had FASD included in their training. Nobody else had. Um, the type of information that they prefer is information on behaviours that might prompt assessment. Have we like leapt ahead about 40 slides here? No? And they want organisations to help them deal with um, FASD. We don't, we don't have a specific organisation for this in uh, WA. Um, but uh, one of the magistrates in WA just come back from a conference in Canada. And she's highly motivated to see something like this get off the ground. And she's very, very motivated to, do, to see this happen. Um, they said they'd like their information provided by website or email. I am missing some slides here. I wonder if they've blanked out. Oh no, we'll go here. Okay, so have you ever dealt with a person who you suspected had a FASD? And most people said they didn't know. Maybe some said they'd done it two or three times. But when we asked them, have you ever dealt with someone who had a FASD that you actually really knew they had a FASD, the numbers were much, much lower. And again, that reflects back onto health, that we haven't been diagnosing these people, that you've, you've got a cohort of people that you're expected to deal with, and they're coming to your doorstep with limited information. We asked people how they suspected that someone might have a FASD, and top of the list was physical appearance, IQ, and inability to learn from their mistakes. Well, if you think back to the um, iceberg picture, it's really only the little peak of the iceberg that has features that look abnormal, physical features that look abnormal. The bulk of the people with FASD is the entire iceberg under the water who look completely normal. So if we're relying on abnormal appearance as something to twig us to think, does this person have a FASD, that's a problem. It's useful, but it means you're only going to be getting just the tip of the iceberg. Other things that prompted people to think they might have a FASD were issues around inability to show empathy. Genuinely seems not to remember. Not fictitiously, not fraudulently, but genuinely seems not to remember. Highly suggestible, which has implications for interview. Interview either at the street level when first engaging with police. Interview with why did you fail your bail conditions. Highly suggestible. Uh, very few in the judiciary knew whether the mum was an alcoholic, but within corrective services uh, there was a much higher percentage who actually knew whether the mum was alcoholic. That's quite staggering compared to the knowledge that was measured in uh, North America. Um, how did you suspect? Unable to follow court proceedings, unable to follow parole orders, vulnerable to peer pressure, continually disobeys, cannot read or comprehend basic instructions, has explosive episodes and has multiple substance addictions. How did you know that the person had it? You'd been advised, which would be a rare event. There was a history, again, a rare event. Characteristic facial features, again, a rare event. And again, something we shouldn't be relying on. Do you think a more detailed knowledge of FASD would assist in your work? Everybody said yes. Have you ever recommended or required that a person be sent for diagnosis? Uh, most people said no, and that again probably speaks to the fact that you wouldn't know where to send them, or there isn't anywhere to send them. I'm just going to pull out some comments now that people made from the corrections answers, so it's around, didn't know it existed in adults, might suspect it, but we don't know where to send them for diagnosis. You kid me, the existing infrastructure will prevent managing these offenders in any other than being incarcerated. So the stuff that Donna was talking about this morning, the need for justice reinvestment, the need for alternative sentencing, we acknowledge that it's really important. We acknowledge that your role is pivotal in maintaining these people out of jail, but currently we don't have the resources for that. As mainstream prisoners, they are required to comply with work within the system which cannot cater for individual needs. Counselling won't fix it because they are intrinsically physically broken. They are then released back into dysfunctional communities to be cared for by the individuals who drank them into this condition. Education within the system will make no difference. Put the money and in education into the community to prevent further damaged births. 
that was obviously a very strong opinion. I um, don't know what you think about that. Um, it's doubtful that the department has a contracted service for this purpose. I would usually assess the person requiring psychological counselling support based on their behaviours, irrespective of whether they had a FASD. My understanding of this issue is diagnosis is difficult. It's a group of characteristics. What difference would it make anyway? We don't have the facilities. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the support. We have overcrowding. You work it out. We manage the majority and ignore the minority as long as they comply. When they don't, we make them. There's currently no support. Labelling without places to refer them is counterproductive. Living in remote areas when assessment and assistance occurs in major centres. Never heard of it before today. Due to the complex nature, there's no facilities. And they were saying the Kimberley, but that could be anywhere remotely. Discussion of the condition is in its infancy. It's still difficult to access resources. The things they wanted were qualified specialists, specific programs and strategies to assist, sufficient information to stimulate departmental discussion, and what to look out for. And these exist overseas. We're wanting to develop them here in Australia. So over 90% were aware of FAS. They were knowledgeable about what caused it. They agreed that it was probably identifiable. Sadly, most had heard about it from the news, not in their training, with the exception of corrective services. And nearly all of them said they wanted more training and more information. Sadly, suspicion of FASD was based on these top four. Maternal alcohol consumption is good, correct. But the rest may trick you up. They more commonly have a normal IQ. They more commonly look normal. They do commonly have poor attention span. Few were referred because they didn't know where to send them to. And they didn't know if it would change how they'd manage the child or the youth. So there's widespread agreement that it's important. There's widespread agreement that we're unprepared and there aren't enough resources. And currently there's limited availability of alternative sentencing options. But obviously that's cost effective based on the stats that Donna has presented this morning. We need improved capacity to meet people like this with their special needs to treat them equally before the law and within the law. And it requires us to modify our language and our interaction at every stage of their journey through justice. So uh, we're working at training and education. As a result of the study, we have, um, as I said, we've worked with correctional services staff, we've worked with magistrates, we're back to a magistrates conference next year. The Chief Justice has come back to us and asked us to update his bench book there's a lot happening uh, with no money. <laughs> There's a lot happening. Um, but in the long run, it's going to be people like yourself on the ground, um, understanding the way these individuals' brains work uh, and being uh, given capacity to support them uh, as well as you do, but even better. Um, that's a link to our website, and that's some of the stuff that we do. That's the bench book. It looks like... Uh, a cookbook, doesn't it? It's a bench book. And um, watch the space. This is already a very good book. Chapter 4 is the section on disabilities with a whole lot of stuff about FASD. But we're going to have this even better. So we're going to get people putting stuff in it about autism, about being an adolescent. We're going to make sure there's lots and lots of stuff in there that will be to the benefit of all the kids that are going through the court system in WA. North America, I think, outstrips us with stuff that they've got available, and I recommend these websites to you. The Canadian Bar Association and the American Bar Association uh, made resolutions um, this year, actually, in last end of last year, specifically accounting for FASD as being an important component of how they deal with people through the courts and realising that it must alter the way they uh, see them before the law. Um, there is a FASD screening tool, there's a probation officer's screening tool that's available through the Asante Centre. There's another one that was put out by, um, it's another group in North America. They're both really good and you can download them for free from their websites. And they really speak to kind of a checklist of all the things that we just went through about the criminal history that might alert you to think, does this person have a FASD? Thanks. Any questions? <laughs>